Hi everyone, Zoe here. Welcome to part three of the Newbie's Guide to Charkov. Now, if you've not seen the other two parts, you might want to go and see them because they lay the foundations for what we're going to be talking about here. However, as a quick running summary, we've made Charkov in a very small tin and an Altoids tin. So of course, the natural progression to that is going to be a big tin. Now, I've also shown in these videos that I tried using Naked Flames once, but I got a little bit lazy and didn't wait for embers, so we're going to do it with embers. And we've ignited it with percussion fire starting, so flint and steel, and ferro rods, technically chemical percussion, and solar magnification. Now, whenever I film these videos, I try and avoid jargon or accessibility issues outside of people that can't understand English. If you can understand English, hopefully my video is quite accessible because I'm not using cockney rhyming slang or most cultural issues that you might find with me being based in the UK. However, when it came to the large tin we're going to be using, for references, here's our toys tin. That's quite a large tin. There is a cultural issue in the UK with these tins. And I just wanted to give you a brief glimpse into that. Now, I don't know why, but for some reason, these are cursed. If anyone have ever played Dark Souls, you're probably aware of the Mimic. The Mimic is a chest, or a creature, that looks like a chest is barely indistinguishable from a regular chest and it could hold treats and it turns to hold disappointment and death well, this is where the analogy kind of breaks down but many grandchildren many children have found these in cupboards or under stairs in the kitchen and they're hoping as they lift that lid they're hoping for sweets chocolates biscuits and they usually find the haberdashery kit I don't know why Culturally in the UK, if you have a haberdashery kit, it somehow gravitates to being in an old biscuit tin. I just wanted to give you a glimpse of that. Although I try and avoid UK specific jargon, can you feel the pain? Can you feel the pain of so many people that have been wandering through cupboards hungry one night, found these tins and just had that second of hope to have it dashed when they discover needles, threads? Bobby pins, thimbles, I don't sew. That's the extent of my sewing knowledge. So, now I've given you a very, very brief and quite silly glimpse into UK culture. Now you'll be glad to know, in preparation for this video, I already chopped up the material. Uh, it was the majority of free t-shirts, because I regularly outgrow t-shirts. Issues. And... I can check the labels and see they're 100% cotton, so I'm reusing a resource I would otherwise throw out. Now, just chopping up the t-shirts in preparation for this video to fill the tin took me four hours. That's four hours of my life in preparation for a video that I'm never going to get back. But on the positive side, I stopped counting when I got to a thousand pieces of material and I kept going until the tin was full. Compared to an Altoids tin, there's a lot of potential fires in here. Over a thousand potential, biggest air quotes I can manage, fires. Because just getting an ember onto a piece of charcoal isn't a guaranteed fire. You've still got the issues of manual dexterity or skill for boiling that ember into flame, the issues of uh, finding enough tinder to keep a fire going, weather conditions about finding dry tinder, darkness, if you can't actually physically find any, there's still a lot of factors that mean that yeah, a charcoal isn't a guaranteed source of an actual long-lasting fire. But in an ideal world, and in ideal conditions, one piece of charcoal can easily make one fire. And we've just made a potential for a thousand of them. It only took four hours of my life. So, let's make some chalk off.
Right then, let's see what it looks like now it's cooled down. Oh, we could have had to get the lid off. Did it glued itself? There's some kind of residue on there, isn't there? Presumably you can do the paint from the tin. Bleach out a lot of colour, but that's nowhere near done for those topmost ones. Let's have a dig further down. Uh, further down looks a lot more promising. And that is quite a substantial mass of chalk off, but uh, hmm. interesting residue I'm getting on me. So I've kind of removed all the pieces that didn't look quite done, any with a, a bit of colour on them. Quite arbitrary in my choices for some of them. Some of these will be quite useful, quite good and done. But I picked out all these that are done. And as you can tell, anything you get a handful of, it's always good. So there we go. A monster batch of chalk off. And I'll have to put that lot back on for another firing. Right, before I demonstrate any alternative methods of how to uh, ignite charcoal, let's go for what I know works, just to check I've actually done the process properly. And I would say that is a pretty good success. So, let's look at different ways of igniting charcoal. So one of the things I wanted to try and display was how to ignite charcoal off using electricity. So I've just got a regular battery and a pair of crocodile clips which I've snipped to expose the copper. Now I've been tinkering with batteries and copper wiring and apart from getting some rather singed fingers and some smoke I'm not managing to ignite charcoal off. So bearing that in mind I went for a backup option. Now this little beauty is an arc lighter. What it is is basically a small USB chargeable battery which has electrical contacts at the top rather than naked flame. And I'm going to use that to ignite some jar cloth. So we get a nice big bit. Try and remember where the camera actually is. That's a very cheap and easy method of igniting. Jump off. And how about this slightly obscure and strange way of igniting charcoal off? This is the fire piston. Basically, we have an o ring seal and a hollow tube and charcoal off on the end. And what we do is we compress that air. And because there's an O-ring, the air can't escape. Because of the rapidity of the compression, 
the air heats up. You'll find the description everyone says is like a diesel engine and ignites the charcoal off. And we've got to get out there pretty quick because we'll use up all the oxygen in the burning. Now, someone online, when I was looking for ticks and tips and trips for this, said that a fire piston should be nowhere near a newbie's guide to charcoal off. But it was the only outstanding fire starting method I could think of involving charcoal off. And a guy called Benjamin basically said that this thing relies on the alignment of the planets, a kiss from an angel, and the blood sacrifice. So, let's see how badly this goes. I only had this work three times so far. So basically I'm going to apply pressure, force that piston all the way down, and we'll see how we go. So guard my hand, because it's going to hurt like hell. Oxygen. Oh. Oh. Trying the other way around. How about we try and use the charcoal box? Well, that was unexpected. Definitely keeping that in the video. So, apparently if the angels don't give you a kiss and the planets aren't in alignment, your only sacrifice needs to be your charcoal box. And that is a proper survival mistake. So, that's part three of the Newbie's Guide to Charcoal done. So, we've made a small tin, the industrial standard, so to speak, and a family side portion. I've shown that I need to practice more with electrical fire starting, but until then, this very reliable little arc lighter has earned its place in my EDC kit, and maybe I'll do a future video when I'm much better at using a fire piston that doesn't destroy things. So, stay tuned for part four of the Newbies Guide to Charcoal we're going to be looking at one more method that we've already displayed, but a slight variation on it, and a very, very obvious method of how to ignite charcoal off. I'm also going to be stepping out of my comfort zone and making char with things that aren't t-shirts for a change. So, thank you for watching this video on the Newbies Guide to Charcoal Off Part 3. Keep an eye out for Part 4. Please like and share the video, it definitely helps me out a lot. If you really, really like the sort of thing I'm doing, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if you really, really, really like it and want to support me on Patreon, I'm on there, go find me. Any support for the channel is greatly appreciated. Until then, get out there and do the impossible every day. Well, that was unexpected. <laughs>